Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Mr. Denny's fun e-learning classroom. I'm Mr. Denny. Good to see you. Hope quarantine is going well. Uh, hope you're doing okay. So we're not going to be back in the classroom anytime soon, uh, but we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best to learn something, to get smarter, to, to be productive, uh, and I'm going to help you with that. I hope you're doing okay. Um, I'm doing all right. I've got coffee. What more do I need? Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Here we are going to be talking about uh, civil rights. We're going to be talking about civil rights movements pretty much all throughout the rest of this month. Um, so we've, we've kind of talked about history kind of up to the, the mid-70s. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going backwards just a little bit. We're going to take a few steps back and we're going to look at what were the civil rights movements happening throughout history. So we know what's been happening in history um, and we're now going to be able to kind of fill in these blanks of, of what were African Americans, what were women, uh, what were uh, Hispanic people, uh, gay, lesbian, like what what were these minority groups doing in the midst in the midst of history? Because like that's really that's history, right? That's that's what the study is about. Um, so let's jump into what we're talking about today. And that is, if I can get it to change, cool. Uh, so we're talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, it's pronounced Du Bois, uh, and Booker T. Washington. Uh, we can kind of see two different ideas about what society should be like, uh, specifically what the fight for African American civil rights should be like in these two people. Uh, so we've got our lecture notes out. Uh, I've got my lecture notes here on my phone. So if you see me looking down, that's what I'm going to be looking at. Uh, but maybe you've got the Google Docs, the PDF, maybe you printed it out. Whatever works for you. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so our goal here is to be able to compare and contrast the significance of these two men. Um, before we can do that, we got to take a few steps back. Like I said, we got to go back to Reconstruction. So we got to go back to Reconstruction. So we'll remember that Reconstruction is taking place after the Civil War from about 1865, 1877, and it's focused on, yes, fixing the infrastructure, bridges, roads, uh, rebuilding the relationship, and most importantly here, transforming the economy of the South into a free labor economy, given that now African Americans are free, that, that slavery has been abolished. Um, so what was supposed to guarantee civil rights for African Americans after the Civil War during Reconstruction? Uh, well, that's going to be the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments. Now, hopefully this is review. I mean, I know we talked about it last semester, but hopefully still feels like review. Um, remember, the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, unless you're in prison. 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, equal application of the law to all citizens, no matter what. Uh, 15th Amendment is the right to vote, specifically for African American men. Remember that women they're not getting the right to vote until 1919, but we have the 15th Amendment for now uh, to guarantee uh, the right to vote for African-American men. Uh, now, what kind of puts a stop to that? What puts a hold on that? Uh, that's going to be Jim Crow laws uh, in the Jim Crow South. And these are kind of taking place on two different fronts. They're losing political uh, equality as well as social equality. So on the political equality front, um, we're seeing the grandfather clause brought in that is um, essentially uh, using the slave status of your grandfather to take away the civil rights of African Americans in the present. Um, poll taxes, literacy tests, outright intimidation at the polls to try and discourage African Americans from exercising their 15th Amendment right. So that's on the political equality front. Uh, Jim Crow laws are also uh, discriminating against African Americans through systematic legal codes of segregation. So we're actually seeing this in the legal system of, of southern states um, in segregated transportation, right? So we're thinking buses, um, segregated schools, and we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, I think next lesson we're going to be talking about how schools uh, were segregated, and then the the fight to, to get rid of that. Um, segregated restaurants, and this one is pretty wild, segregated uh, funeral homes, segregated morgues. Even after death, uh, the South is still trying to institute segregation, which is, which is kind of uh, insane there. Um, 
And so that brings us to two men who are each seeking to to remedy these these uh, uh, discrimination, these discriminatory uh, laws. Um, and we're going to start with Booker T. Washington, only because he was born first, and so we'll just we'll just let him go first. Uh, so we're looking at Booker T. Washington. What's his background? Where's he born? Uh, so he's born into slavery in Southwest Virginia uh, in 1856. And that's really important here, right? He's in, he's born into slavery, and so that's really going to kind of shape his mindset. It's going to shape um, his knowledge of the South, of the climate there, of slavery, of what civil rights, of how that can actually progress. Right, so he's born into slavery, and it's the Thirteenth Amendment that actually brings him out of slavery. Uh, he starts out working uh, in a salt mine, in coal mines. He worked as a custodian. He was mostly self-taught uh, until he decided to self-enroll in high school. He graduates at sixteen, so he's extremely bright. Um, he, after graduation, he went back to his hometown to work as a teacher. Uh, and he's eventually appointed the head of a school called the Tuskegee Institute. And this is a place where they were able to offer uh, higher education, uh, further like industrial training, job training, um, or thinking trades, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so that is where he kind of gets to start promoting his idea of African-American civil rights. And that is getting African-Americans jobs, getting them to, to be able to make money for themselves. Uh, so what is kind of his overall plan, um, kind of jumping off from the Tuskegee Institute? Well, he's interested in long-term civil rights. Uh, and he outlines this in what's called the Atlanta Exposition Address, which we're, we're going to take a look at. Um, but, but Washington's uh, idea is that uh, in the long term, long term, blacks would eventually gain full participation in society by showing themselves to be responsible, reliable American citizens. So for him, it's about um, not getting too much all at once, not fighting for political and social equality first, but first showing that African Americans can contribute to the economy, kind of playing into um, kind of Southern white beliefs about, uh, about success and so he, he believes that economic power, that is, if African Americans can show uh, industry, thrift, intelligence, and property, that if African Americans, Americans can show that, that then those prejudiced Southern whites are going to be more likely to be on board with the overall civil rights movement, right? So... Booker T. Washington is about getting African Americans jobs first, getting them job skills first, getting um, them financially equal uh, to to Southern whites, to, to the white population. And then he says you can win over Southern whites and have them get on board with the civil rights movement. Right. So he's thinking more long term. Um, and. Because he believes in trade, because he believes in education, in industrial skills, um, he wins over the support of wealthy whites, including Andrew Carnegie, including uh, John D. Rockefeller, right? Those um, uh, robber barons, captains of industry that we've talked about before, they were on board with what Booker T. Washington was talking about. Um, even Teddy Roosevelt, even uh, President Taft, they publicly invited him to the White House for dinner and to advise on policy. Um, Booker T. Washington, he, he's quoted as saying, I have learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has had to overcome while trying to succeed. So what's he saying there? He's saying that success is measured by what you have overcome rather than where you are, right? So the more adversity, the more obstacles, the more hurdles you've jumped over, that's how you define success. Not necessarily uh, reaching immediate power, um, immediate political social equality, right? So he believes that if African Americans can show that they can overcome those obstacles on their own, that the Southern whites, they're going to be more likely to, to get on board with their civil rights movement. Um, now, let's compare that to W.E.B. Du Bois. So he's born about 10 years later, and he is born in a free state. He uh, is born free. He's born in Massachusetts. Um, 
and remember, there is still a, a certain level of discrimination in the North, but nowhere to the degree that there is in the South. Uh, du Bois ends up getting two bachelor's degrees. He gets one from Fisk University. Uh, he then goes on to get one at Harvard. Uh, he got that bachelor's at Harvard, by the way, because Harvard didn't recognize his bachelor's degree from Fisk University. They're like, we don't recognize that. Um, also, uh, he then goes on to study in Berlin as like a, a scholarship fellow. And then he comes back and he gets a PhD in Harvard. Um, he's the first African-American actually to get a PhD, right? So Du Bois is like, he's brilliant, right? He, he is an absolute genius. He knows his stuff. Um, he ends up being a professor at Atlanta University. And then he goes on to form uh, this group called the Niagara Movement, and then eventually the NAACP. So let's kind of break those things down. Um, so the Niagara Movement, it starts after Booker T. Washington gives that Atlanta speech where he outlines uh, industry and, and studying the trades. So he and other African-American civil rights activists, they write basically a formal declaration saying, we are not on board with, with what Booker T. Washington's vision is. We don't think that you have to wait uh, for, for the white population to be on board with the civil rights movement, that, that there is no such thing as moving too fast, right? Like, these are things everyone should have right now. Um, so I'm going to try to move my guy here. There we go. Um, so he eventually goes on to form out of the Niagara movement. Uh, that goes on to become the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, and that, that word colored, that actually came from Du Bois' suggestion um, rather than black because he wanted to kind of make it more inclusive to include dark-skinned people everywhere. Um, so he's, he's kind of looking out for a more broader base, a more broad audience here. Um, and so his plan for African-American civil rights, if I can get it to, there we go. Um, his plan was to fight for full civil rights, to fight for full political representation, that you don't have to kind of measure it out over a long period of time, that we know what's right, we know what African-Americans uh, deserve, let's fight for that. Um, he believed that capitalism, he believed that um, this emphasis on money and and like getting yourself up financially and economically, he believed that was kind of the primary cause of racism, which, if you think about it, uh, the South heavily relied on slavery. Why? Because they were primarily agricultural. They were primarily about cotton and, and farming. Um, so he believed capitalism, which is kind of what Booker T. Washington is, is pushing as a solution. He believes capitalism is actually the cause of racism. Um, he, was a, he was a big peace activist. He advocated nuclear disarmament later in life. Um, and so he's definitely uh, leaning to the left of Booker T. Washington politically. Um, he insists on these civil rights and these, and these civil rights changes. Um, he insists that those are going to be brought around by an intellectual elite that he refers to as the talented 10th, kind of the talented 10th, uh, 10%, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And he, he talked about in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, which was uh, a collection of essays where he wanted to demonstrate black intellectualism, where he wanted to demonstrate um, just the, the depth of ideas in the African-American population. He says there, they must be conscious of how they view themselves, uh, they being African-Americans, um, as well as being conscious of how the world views them. Talking about how kind of uh, African-Americans have to have this dual sense of not only their sense of self, but how they're being perceived. Uh, so what is the talented 10th? What's the, the idea behind that? So uh, Du Bois is talking there about the, it's likely that one in 10 black men are likely to become leaders of their race when it comes to education, writing books, going on to, to scholarly leadership, and that it's those kind of 10% that uh, are going to help to bring up the rest of the African American population. Uh, in, in the the base for that, the, the way he was going to get there, according to Du Bois, is through a classical education. Maybe that sounds familiar, right? That's, I mean, that's Indianapolis classical schools. That's Riverside. That's like our whole thing, right? Uh, so he strongly believes that this classical education is needed to reach 
someone's full potential rather than trades, rather than the, the industrial education. So he believes that a focus on grammar, logic, rhetoric, that this is what is going to allow a person to reach their full potential. And that just because you know a trade, just because you know how to work in a factory, you know how to build something, um, that, that isn't necessarily what's going to allow you to reach your full potential. He looks at that as just, that's just, that's just how someone makes a living, right? There's, but there's more to life than that uh, if you're Du Bois. So uh, we've got a primary source document. Uh, we're going to look at one together, and then I'll talk through it. And then you've got one, of course, on your own to take a look at. So let's go over to it. Uh, oh, this is a this is a great quote on the Talented Tenth that I, I just wanted to pull out here. Um, Men, we shall have only as we make manhood the object of the work of the schools. Intelligence, broad sympathy, knowledge of the world that was and is, and of the relation of men to it. This is the curriculum of that higher education which must underlie true belief. On this foundation we may build breadwinning, skill of hand, and quickness of brain, with never a fear, lest the child and man mistake the means of living for the object of life. There he talks there at the end. Don't mistake the means of living. Don't mistake work, like how you make your living. Don't mistake that for the object of life, for the goal, right? Doing an industry is not the same as, as your ultimate goal, as your ultimate destiny in life, right? That's Du Bois. That's Du Bois's idea. So let's go back. Let's take a look at what Booker T. Washington, what he says in his Atlanta exposition speech. So uh, I have the document here. I want you to go ahead and pause the video, pause the lecture, and I want you on your own to go ahead and take a look at this document, read through it once, try to get a feel for what it's talking about here. Um, pause the video and then we'll talk about it together. So take a moment, pause it. Okay, you've unpaused the video, uh, you have read through it. Let's talk about what he's saying here. Let's try to break down what he's saying. That way when we get to Du Bois, which is really a response to this, uh, we can kind of think, okay, this is what Du Bois is responding to. So, let me go back, there we go. So, uh, in the beginning there, uh, Booger T. Washington, he's been invited to give this speech to a primarily white audience. And that's important here to remember. Uh, Booker T. Washington was brought to give this speech um, because they thought that he would be the best person to speak on civil rights issues to this particular audience. And if we look at the content, we can kind of see why. Um, so there at the beginning, the opportunity here afforded will awaken among us a new era of industrial progress. In that first paragraph, he's talking about how um, People who are coming out of slavery, who, who are coming into society for the first time, um, are possibly ignorant, that they're inexperienced, and that it isn't unusual that when you're first getting into the society, that you might try to immediately go for the top, that you might immediately try to go for Congress or to, to be in the state legislature. Um, and Booker T. Washington, we know, he believes that people should be doing the opposite, that we need to start at the bottom. We should not be going straight for the top. Remember, he's all about that long-term civil rights movement. Um, and so he says, to those of my race who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the Southern white man, I would say, cast down your bucket where you are. So there he's saying, uh, you, you should be satisfied with those skills, with those jobs that you already have. Cast down your bucket settle where you are, right? That's where you should start, is you should start at the bottom, that you should start in agricultural, uh, or agriculture, mechanics, in commerce, in domestic service, that you should start there because no race can prosper. We see here, oh, I can move my mouse. No race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. So Booker T. Washington, he's saying there to cast down your bucket where you are, to start at the bottom, uh, to kind of use the skills you have to get yourself to a higher place in life. Uh, so then he also ends that paragraph very interestingly. He ends that paragraph by saying, uh, nor should we permit our grievances 
to overshadow our opportunities. What does he mean by that? So we should not allow our grievances. We shouldn't allow our complaints. We shouldn't allow uh, the problems that we have as, as African Americans. We should not allow that to overshadow these opportunities. What he's saying here uh, is that African Americans, they shouldn't let this greater civil rights struggle, don't let that stop you from gaining financial security. Don't let that stop you from making money, from, from working. Uh, there's nothing wrong with working on a farm or working in a factory, right? You have to start somewhere. Don't kind of let this greater goal of uh, social and political equality, don't let that get in the way of the opportunity to make money, to, to better yourself financially. So uh, we have this last section here. And remember that kind of in the late 1800s, after the Civil War during Reconstruction, remember that the United States, and specifically the North, was experiencing a ton of immigration. A ton of new immigrants are coming into the United States. And so what he's talking about here is today the white race hires people of foreign birth and language to help the South. So he's talking about here about how people in the South were looking at these new immigrants as a potential source of, of revitalization, that they're going to kind of help the reconstruction of the South. And Booker T. Washington is saying, uh, cast down your bucket where you are. And he's saying this to the white population in the South. He's saying uh, to the white population, you should look at the African Americans as the people who are going to help the South, that African Americans are the people who are going to help the South, that it is uh, here, uh, cast it down among the 8 million black people whose habits you already know without strikes and labor wars, they have plowed your fields. So that sentence right there, without strikes and labor wars, they have plowed your fields. Uh, he, he's referring to like labor movements. He's referring to strikes and unions. He's saying African Americans of the South didn't do that. They plowed your fields. They cleared your forests. They have built your railroads and cities. They have helped make possible this wonderful showplace of Southern progress. Um, so he's talking about here that relationship that was forged between African Americans and whites, specifically during slavery, right? He's talking about all of these positive qualities between African Americans and whites. Um, we nursed your children. We have watched by the sick bed of your mothers and fathers. Um, that we are ready to lay down our lives to defend you. No foreigner can do this, right? So he's kind of drawing upon that existing relationship between whites and African Americans to say, start there. Start with that relationship. Start building. Okay. So we know where Booker T. Washington stands. Go ahead and go on to the next. Uh, document that's going to be an, an excerpt by Du Bois. Remember what Booker T. Washington is talking about and remember that Du Bois is pretty much directly responding to him and he is not on board with Washington's message. Okay, nice work. If you have any questions, send me an email. Uh, I don't know, rewind the video maybe? Maybe. I know I talk a little bit fast sometimes, um, but all right. I believe in you. You got this. Have an excellent day.